very sorry for your loss. I'll do all I can to solve the death of your friend slash family member slash pet. Scanning for audio. Welcome once again to a Tin Dog Podcast. This time talking about, well, let's call it the one with the ghosts. Under the Lake, Capaldi, 2005, episode 3, or part 1 of the one with the ghosts. Now, there is, there has been much talk, let's say, about the problems with the two-parters. And I suspect the problems with the two-parters are... Well, stuff us old school fans have. You see, we got so used to watching full, massive, long omnibus editions of Doctor Who and the whole disc at one time that having to sit through and not having, well, the whole story there in front of you just gets annoying. Knowing that there's going to be a whole extra bit of narrative. You see, we've kind of got used to there being one serving of Doctor Who. Oh, you see, I'm moaning now and I shouldn't be. Perfectly decent story. Absolutely perfectly decent story. Written by, well, you know, Toby Whithouse. So that's going to be a good thing. And it does what old Doctor Who did extremely well. Base Under Siege. (sighs) And remember, with Base Under Siege, the boxes that you need to tick are get rid of any attempt at rescue so that all problems must be solved by themselves and make sure you can't escape in the TARDIS. They're the two boxes that you need to tick straight off in order to have that lovely claustrophobic feel. Yes, it's another underwater story, which is, you know, understandable, because it's a base, and next week's is called Before the Flood. And as you know that there's a time travel story, and you know it's a two-parter story, you can kind of guess that they have to travel back in time to exactly the same place, but earlier, and not underwater. Cold War was set underwater, I'll grant you that, and yes, everyone got wet, But this thing's a futuristic base. So it looks bigger, it looks better, and it looks, yes, I grant you, a little bit damp. But it's not dark and foreboding. It's got a lot more in common with, well, let's not bring up the Merkur at this point. Because, let's face it, it looks great. And it's a nicely well-lit background. Undersea bases that are lit properly. Oh, who would have thought that would be a good thing in the future? Now, Toby is an expert at writing the supernatural. Let's face it, he's written brilliant stuff with being human. But he also wrote, you know, the game. So this guy is basically just a good writer who happens to understand genre. And that is the sort of thing we really need to be going on with Doctor Who. So, let's have a look at this basic story. When you're watching it for the first time, little things pop into your head. Like, oh, she's got sign language going on. Is there a reason? Is it part of some sort of politically correct employment strategy enforced by the BBC, or is it, much more likely, something important for the plot? It's one of the things you get taught at writing class. Have nothing on the screen that isn't important for the plot. But that's not real life. In real life, everything's happening at once. Things which aren't important to your particular plot, to your life. But that's what's happening. That's what makes things more real. So perhaps that's why it was included. You know for a fact it wasn't going to be. Also at the beginning... Guy turns up and you go, oh, I know him. He's the voice of the cube. He's the bloke who's in loads of other things because he's got a fantastic voice. I like him. And then he gets killed. And you go, it was a bit of a waste. They've hired a fantastic actor to play. Oh, hang on. No, he'll be coming back. Oh, look, there he is. And then he's a ghost who doesn't speak. This guy's got one of the greatest voices in television. And they've hired him to be a mute or to mouth some driving instructions. So my issues with the two-parters, well, I've dealt with them. Let's move on. Let's have a look at the notebook and see what else I've got scribbled in in green. Or is it red or is it blue or is it black or is it purple? Yes, I colour code my notes. Not in order to make them easier to understand, just in order to be able to differentiate between the writing. Yes, this episode has some brilliant moments. Clara and the cards, for example. 
but she has become his enabler and they are kind of milking the whole Clara's getting in it for the excitement and the adventure thing. You know, she's going to become too excitable. She's become the addiction storyline that was running a few years ago. They've gone back to that and that's fair enough. But let's face it, adrenaline junkies, they very rarely get better. I could and normally would at this point go on and on about ghosts and supernatural things in Doctor Who and that they always have to be some sort of alien reason and yeah that's what's happening and ghosts aren't in Doctor Who the same way that religion and I go into that whole bag of things you've heard me talk about those things a thousand times you really don't need to hear me go on about it yet again it's just not important now the main ghost the bloke in the top hat he's he's apparently called Prentice according to some notes elsewhere not that it's ever mentioned here, because he's the mystery, and he's played by Peter Kay. Now, I've got a love-hate relationship with Peter Kay, because when he first started his career, he was a sort of shock interviewer called Dennis Pennis. It was a character that he played on various comedy programmes, and I had an instant dislike for this man. Except, of course, Paul Kay is definitely not Dennis Pennis. He's a character creator, just like Ali G., the guy's a really good actor. You do get him if ever a role involves bodily fluids and being a bit odd. He's kind of the go-to man. See Jonathan Strange for that one. And yes, he's never put in a bad performance. But he does put you on edge, mainly because of the bodily fluids. But let me tell you a quick story. When he was Dennis Pennis, he'd leapt out and basically insulted Steve Martin. He said, you know, would you consider being in a film that was, say, good? Which, of course, got a cheap laugh and moved on. Except the bloke who was Dennis Pennis got a bit upset that he'd done this. And he sent a massive, long apology letter to Steve Martin. Because you know what? Deep down, everyone's going to be a bit human from time to time. That got my vote. That makes me go back and watch him. So I can live with that. Now, by this point, we've got the Doctor and his sunglasses. We've also still got that terrible theme tune, which we just can't seem to shift. Please, can we have something new? Please, I'm absolutely begging you. But the Sonic sunglasses? Oh dear, I was really hoping they were a one-story thing. And the TARDIS might provide him with something new, or good, or better, or... It's pants. I know, I know why they've done it. You know, when you've got your front door key that looks just like the TARDIS key, so you can pretend as a kid what's going on and be all fun and happy and dandy and fluffy, but no, that's not what it's about. Every kid can pretend. Who's wearing glasses? Oh yeah, they're the geeks. They can pretend they're Sonic glasses. Oh, they can always play. Yeah, that's great. No, it's not. It's pants. It does stop the toys being available, but I'm sure they'll be out there somewhere, and it makes cosplaying slightly more affordable, or less affordable, depending on what brand they are. Oh, now, this business with the Faraday cage. Yeah. Can I just ask you a question? Do you know that much about Faraday cages? Do you know what they're for? Do you know how important they are? Do you know how they work? I always thought they were a sealed metal unit that couldn't get in or out, which, of course, the Doctor manages to get through. And Anyway, what we need is, well, James from the occasional Doctor Who podcast. Yeah, he would know all about Faraday cages. Greetings, one and all. It's James here from Doctor Who, an occasional podcast. I want to talk to you a little bit about Faraday cages. As the name implies, they were named after Michael Faraday, the chap who invented them way back in 1836. Now, Michael Faraday was a brilliant 19th century scientist. He was a real, real grafter. He used to put in tremendous hours in his lab, uh, working mainly in the Royal Society in London. Um, and it's largely due to his efforts and his work that we understand a tremendous amount about both electricity and magnetism as a result of his work. Even, for heaven's sake, the unit of capacitance is named after him, the Farad, an absolute giant in science. Now, put simply, Faraday cages shield their contents from electric fields, mainly static electric fields, but some of them will even um, shield the contents from electromagnetic radiation. Faraday cages take all sorts of shapes. Some are literal cages, some are boxes, spheres, some even take the form of chain mail, which people can, can wear. Essentially, they're made out of really uh, highly conductive metal. And they, what they do is they distribute 
uh, charge around the exterior of the cage to prevent whatever uh, electric field is outside of the cage from getting into the cage. Certain Faraday cages will even deflect electromagnetic radiation. One of my favourite videos on this is, is a series of lectures by the brilliant MIT professor, well, he's, he's retired now, but Walter Lewin, a, a Dutchman working over in the States, and he's filmed a whole load of his lectures which are available for free on YouTube. And he shows that he, you can actually walk into a Faraday cage with an old FM radio and it'll stop working. You won't be able to hear the radio anymore because the Faraday cage essentially distributes the charge around the cage so that no radio waves can get inside the cage, at least not of um, a low enough frequency anyway. He also demonstrates in the same series of lectures that you can be perfectly safe stood inside a Faraday cage from uh, a very, very large Van de Graaff generator, um, which is a device that creates colossal electric fields, huge great big sparks and arcs of electricity. Now, this works, of course, because the Faraday cage is essentially a hollow conductor in which the charge remains on the external surface of the cage. So there is a, ch an, a charge, an electric field of zero inside the cage, and on one side you've got a positive charge, on the other side you've got a negative charge. So it just flows, the current flows round the conductor, but isn't able to pass into the inside, the hollow part of the Faraday cage. Now you might think, where's the link? Well, the link to Doctor Who is, there's a fantastic band called Arc Attack who use Tesla coils in their performance to make music. Now, Tesla coils are a bit like Van de Graaff generators in that they create huge, great big bolts of lightning because of the, the fact that they generate enormous electric fields. And they utilize this to make music. The lightning and effect of different frequency will produce a different note. Uh, but you need something in the middle to conduct through uh, to Earth, and you need to have a Faraday cage. So there are videos of various different performers uh, wearing chain mail, high very, very good chainmail. I wouldn't go in wearing ordin ordinary stuff that, you know, you would wear as, as armour to protect yourself from arrows and so on. But there's even videos of people like Adam Savage from the Mythbusters uh, standing in a, in a Faraday cage, a literal cage, doing a little dance, a little jig, whilst Arc Attack used the Tesla coils to play the Doctor Who theme. Uh, Faraday cages are incredibly useful for a whole variety of different things. But I thought of uh, a really interesting example, which is if you're sitting in your car, your car, in effect, is a huge, great big Faraday cage. And um, a student of mine once asked, would it be possible to be electrocuted if you were sit uh, by a bolt of lightning if you were sitting in your car? And the answer is no, because the, the whole shell of the car will act as a Faraday cage and will distribute any charge that hits the, the, the metal exterior of the car around it and through and into the ground, meaning that you'll be absolutely safe inside the Faraday cage. So there you go. I've waffled on for about four minutes, but hopefully you've learned something new. Physics, it's awesome. Thanks for listening. Have a good one. Well, I'm hoping that sorted that out. So yeah, there's things we need to deal with. There's Clara's addiction. There's the fact that this is timey-wimey and takes place after itself, which of course is nailed home completely by the Doctor appearing at the end. What's going on with the eyes? Hmm. What's going on with the lip reading? Why did it feel so really slow? Is that because it's a two-part or is that because we're used to something a lot faster? I just don't know. So before I go, I just need to deal with a few other things. You see, as you know, I'm watching these Doctor Who's out of order. I'm managing to avoid a lot of spoilers way beforehand because I'm getting to watch them. As we speak, as I record this, we've only had episode one of Doctor Who actually air on TV. So various things I'd missed. I'd not seen the Sisterhood of Khan previews. I'd not seen the meditation of the Doctor. And all of those things made the story better for not seeing them in the first place. So perhaps being spoiler free and not on social media is better. I just don't know. But of course there's been news this week. Things like Coleman finally going where she announced it on Radio 1. I'll try and play that interview after the closing credits. But who's going to be the replacement? Well, my wife went through the internet and she read out some of the possible replacements. And at least two of them she announced that we wouldn't be watching Doctor Who ever again if they were hired. So, please be careful on who you hire. My money's on Arya being hired to play the part, and she's meeting 
the Doctor out of order, because that makes sense, because Moffat, Mr. Moffat, has said that she's not a character we know. So, therefore, it's someone who knows the Doctor. Therefore, and so on, and so on. So, yeah, meeting him out of order, fair enough. Because, let's face it, they may not be filming as much Game of Thrones as they used to. A couple of years off on one programme will allow Maisie Williams to be available for conventions for the rest of her life and guaranteeing her retirement fund because she'll be at the Game of Thrones table and at the Doctor Who table. It's all going to be all right. Of course, the big news for me this week was the closing of the Big Finish forums. Now I'll know a lot of you are on Facebook or Twitter or that kind of thing, but some of us are old-fashioned. Some of us like long, flowing, throwing conversations and not just 140-odd characters. And Facebook, I just can't work. If ever there is a Tin Dog Podcast Facebook page, it will be an automatic update, just like the Tumblr feed and all of the others. But it's the way Big Finish closed the forum. Now, I know they've got their reasons. There's a statement, which I'll read in a minute. But they chose to close the forum when absolutely everyone was looking the other way. September the 19th, during the broadcast of Doctor Who, actually after Big Finish Day 7, which apparently was a fantastic success. It seems a little sneaky, like the way that the Labour Party decided to announce some bad news on September the 11th. Yeah, a good day to hide things. Now, the forum's brilliant. The Big Finish forum was absolutely superb. One of my all-time favourite forums. Place to go, place to discuss things, place to post all of the new Tin Dog podcasts. As soon as I'd recorded them, I put them there so that you could get the reviews nice and early. And yes, a lot of us have migrated across to the new forum called Not the Big Finish Forum. Whether that'll take off, I just don't know. So if you'd like to join us and you're feeling a little bit let down by the absence of a Big Finish forum, come over to us. There's a link on the Tin Dog podcast page. So yes, it might not be elegant, it might not be pretty, but it might look just as the old Big Finish forum. So come and join us. There's a lot of our old friends over there. You know you miss it. Join us there until we find something different or better. Big Finish's statement goes... This is from Ian at Big Finish. We are sorry to announce that the Big Finish Forum is indefinitely suspended with immediate effect. The increasing demands on our time, both in urgent moderation and countering extensive spam attacks, are frequently exceeding our resources and goodwill, and at a time when other social media platforms now prove not only considerably larger but far less open to attack, we have taken this decision. For those wishing to continue following Big Finish news, updates and releases, you're recommended to subscribe to a newsletter sent out regularly with news and exclusive free offers. And of course, there's always the Big Finish news page and podcasts. Alternatively, seek us out on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube or SoundCloud. For the moment, this forum has been turned to a read-only mode for archive slash information purposes only. New posts are not possible. Whether it's coming back, I can only hope. Perhaps differently, with some fan moderators. But that would only be my suggestion. So until then, we're going to hang around at the other place. And hopefully see you there. So yeah, a decent enough story, I'll grant you that. The first part of two, yes. But also standalone individual tales, yes. Spooky, yes. Nicely filmed, yes. The alien spaceship that looks a lot like one of the shuttlecraft from Star Trek, perhaps. No, still good. The whole thing looks like it cost an absolute fortune. I'm looking forward to next week's story. It will be fine. So until then, be seeing you. You've been listening to the Doctor Who Tin Dog Podcast. Available on RSS, iTunes, Audioboom, Tumblr, and wherever podcasts are found. Why not become a supporter of the show by visiting patreon.com slash tin dog. Doctor Who and its associated properties are copyright of the BBC and no infringement is intended. To contact the show, email tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk. The Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance.
Frost is here. Jenna Coleman, good morning. Morning. I feel like we're in a fluster this morning. We are in a fluster, but it's all right. We've got we've got a flat white on the go. We've got a flat white on the go. She's just switched to flat whites, guys. It's big news. It's big news, big news. Do you know what is big news that we need to ask? There's been rumours uh-huh. all this week, everywhere, on the internet, in the papers, about Jenna Coleman leaving Doctor Who. So I've got to ask the question, are you leaving? Pausing for dramatic effect. Um, I have left the TARDIS. You've left the TARDIS? I have. It's happened already? It's happened. I've filmed my last scenes. Oh, my God. Yeah. How was that? And what was... What, why did you... What, 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 what? It was emotional. What um, happened? It was. It's been in the works for a very long time. Right. Um, Stephen and I sat down a long time ago, a year ago, a year and uh-huh. a half ago, and tried to work out the best place to do it and the best place in which... Uh, to tell a really good story so hopefully that's what we've done I think it's really really cool uh-huh. uh, obviously uh, we're not going to give away any details but it will happen at some point this season <gasps> so it's part of the story it's not just like you're, you're not going to be out anymore they've worked it into the oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, uh, we've kind of um, yeah sat down last year and worked a really good kind of story arc out so hopefully um hopefully people will love it i oh think it's really God. cool was that a big decision a tough decision for you to make yeah because there's not a lot of jobs where you get to go to work and have a spaceship and an alien as your best mate and also run away from monsters yeah so you kind of think <laughs> this job is <laughs> only gonna really happen, happen once. Does it? maybe at the council yeah yeah maybe but it's um it's been so much fun i love it there's kind of it's such a unique beast yeah um and uh yeah it's been really special how was doing the last scenes and knowing that was your last last time on doctor who i think i'm in denial i don't think i really don't feel like i've left i think it's because i see peter all the time and i still see matt all the time so i kind of um i kind of believe i still have a key to the tardis which i might do because i kind of stole it yeah um and stole some other bits and pieces that did you actually nick out from the yeah i stole loads what did you get (laughs) (laughs) i don't know if they know yet (laughs) (laughs) they're like go to film like next series they'll be like yeah where's that that piece of tardis gone (laughs) (laughs) where's peter capaldi it started as the scenes were counting down at the end of every scene i'd be like i'm having it having it having it taking it taking it still got the tardis key i stole a thing from eastenders once and everyone went mad stole a dart from the pub did you yeah that's quite a good memento well i thought it was like bbc like b all one bbc so i thought i can always internal mail it back yeah but they weren't happy continuity dart yeah (laughs) Uh, and then did how did you get emotional have you felt emotional yet i did get emotional did you really yeah i so got emotional i was really like i was like really trying to fight against it but you can't help it it just becomes kind of you know it's been my life really for the last three four years yeah and um i just love Peter so much and the job so much and all the crew it becomes really um tight knit and also you know like the TARDIS is like your home and it's uh-huh. all magical and so like such incredible storytelling yeah um uh so yeah I did I, I shed it here and it's so loved as well it must be one of those shows that when you're out and about people always come up and talk to you about honestly the re- like people say the reaction you get of people on the street, I think it's because people love the show so much and because it is that magical adventure storytelling yeah. that, that you kind of get that love directed at you, but yeah. it's all because of Doctor Who. So it's a really, um, yeah, it's, it's a really special show. What is next for you then, Jenna? What's the plan? Um, I am about to start uh, work on Queen Victoria. <gasps> oh yeah, I read this. Yeah. Amazing. I have four weeks so, to so become this, queen. <laughs> this is for, is this a Netflix, the Netflix big show? Uh, no, it's ITV. Oh, ITV. I yeah. did read this. I read this. So you're going to be Queen Victoria. Yes. Huge. Yeah. I mean, that's an okay role. <laughs> yeah. That's fine to do. That's fine to do. What sort of prep do you have to do for that? Um, well, I need to learn to ride a horse. I right. need to learn to waltz, play Beethoven. Oh. Um, yeah, there's, uh, yeah, it's really fun. It's, yeah. um, it's like boot camp. Oh, wow. That's really fun. What a role. <laughs> that's a great role. Well done on that. That'd be awesome.